It was a creative cuisine restaurant that had been open for three years. With counter seats and three tables, it was a small place that would be full with just 20 people. Despite being called creative cuisine, the dishes were more like homemade meals with a special touch from the owner. Most of the customers were regulars, and while the place was never packed, it was never empty either. I took my usual spot at the far end of the counter almost every night. That night, a group of several people occupied two of the three tables, having a drinking party. They were regulars here, colleagues from the same company and department. The one who always brought them here was Emily, their female manager. Normally tense and irritable, she looked completely relaxed, her expression softened as she happily sat around the table with her subordinates. She had truly become a remarkable manager. From my counter seat, I watched her and her group, lost in thought. Five years ago. I was one of their colleagues too. I joined the company fresh out of college and had been there for over 15 years, an old but low-ranking employee. It wasn't out of spite, but I had zero interest in climbing the corporate ladder and was unmotivated about my work. As long as I did my job adequately, left on time, and earned enough to live comfortably, I was content. The company's main business was to develop and provide information systems based on client requests. Those who were motivated honed their skills and advanced their careers. As for me, I had no such ambition and therefore had limited job responsibilities. However, that didn't mean I was unserious. I was never late. Even with tasks as simple as a newbie's, I did what I was given. Sometimes younger employees would ask, can you do this, Michael, and if I couldn't, I'd answer firmly that I can't, and they'd apologize. Internally, they might have thought of me as useless or incompetent. But it never affected workplace relationships. I was a self-admitted salary thief, and no one complained about it. Then Emily was transferred here as a manager. In her early 30s, she looked young, almost inexperienced. Rumor had it she was an elite who had been rapidly promoted. But in reality, it was the company's meaningless policy to promote women to enhance its image. She was promoted as part of the company's superficial policy to actively promote women, making her a victim in a way. To me, who saw work merely as a means of living, it was incomprehensible. But there are people who see career advancement as the purpose of their life. She was the perfect example of that. The company and her ambitions aligned perfectly, resulting in her promotion. However, when she first took the position, it seemed to me she was overburdened and stressed. Having been promoted beyond her capacity just because she was a woman. At first, she tried to maintain distance from her subordinates and acted in an authoritative way. For example, she had a strange fixation on the gender of her subordinates. If a male subordinate served her tea, she'd thank him, but if a female did, she'd lecture her about how serving tea wasn't a woman's job. In our department, there was no such thing as tea servers. Regardless of gender, if you wanted tea, you made it yourself. And if you were making some, you might make some for others too. That was it. She was always tense and irritable. With her childlike face, she looked like a little girl pouting when she was upset. So, in our department, we handled her with kid gloves. To her, a salary thief like me must have seemed especially strange. One time. She came in with reference materials, asking a female subordinate to copy the pages she'd marked with sticky notes. I happened to have nothing to do but count down the minutes until the end of the workday. So, I volunteered to make the copies. Michael? You're going to make the copies? Why? There's no special reason. A man doing copying works? I was astonished by her words. At the same time, I felt sympathy for her. She must have spent her entire career until being promoted to manager doing chores like making tea and copying. Thinking they were women's work, while competing with men behind the scenes. At that moment, I thought from the butt tom of my heart. While promoting women sounds good, simply promoting women for the sake of it is a superficial company policy. Should being a man or a woman be a reason for promoting someone? Even though American society is still often called a male-dominated society, is it right to blindly promote someone just because they are a woman? Regardless of their ability? These thoughts crossed my mind, but I was just a salary thief. I chuckled to myself and spent the rest of the time copying until the end of the workday. About half a month after she became a manager. I happened to share a table with David, the department head, at the restaurant where I went for lunch. 
David was three years my senior and was my mentor when I was a newbie. Back then, he used to look down on me, saying, you can do it if you try, but you just don't try. But when I openly admitted that I didn't want to, David understood and started to look out for me. So, how's Emily doing? Maybe women just aren't cut out for it? Hey now, that's not like you, David. You shouldn't say women aren't cut out for it. I pointed out, and David gave a wry smile. He also seemed to be perplexed by the company's promoting women policy and was struggling with how to handle her. She is motivated, unlike me. Compared to you, anyone would seem motivated. In other words, motivation alone isn't enough, but you can't do without it either. Even with motivation, if the skills aren't there, it just leads to spinning your wheels. In the end, it results in nothing but futile efforts. Promoting women is easy to say, but it's tough in practice. It's hard on everyone involved. Even if it's tough, it has to be done. When I said that, David chuckled. He said he never expected to hear such words from me. I'll take direct responsibility for this project. It was a request from a long-standing client. They wanted to fix and improve some issues in their current information system. She probably wanted to make a significant achievement here. However, this led to overreaching. When the client's requirements document arrived, she responded quickly. Normally, we would visit the client, conduct interviews, and then devise a plan. But she had already prepared a solution independently before the first interview. And it was just one option with no alternatives. Several of the client's representatives were scheduled to attend the interview. Since she didn't want to face them alone, and I was the only one available, I accompanied her. She conducted herself confidently, asking questions and listened to the client's requirements. I started to think my presence was unnecessary until. Here is the improvement plan we've prepared for today, she said confidently, spreading the documents on the table. The client's representatives looked at each other in stunned silence. I glanced at the documents and was shocked. What she had prepared wasn't an improvement of the current system but a complete transition to a new system. She passionately explained the benefits of the new system. However, the clients were just dumbfounded, their eyes wide open. Her passionate speech likely went in one ear and out the other. Wait a minute, Emily, I interjected. I couldn't stand it any longer and stepped in to stop her. She glared at me like a sulking little girl. I shifted my gaze from her to the client's representatives across the table. I apologize for Emily's behavior. I said to them. Then I quickly thought about how to proceed. The other day, at my favorite bar, the chef was complaining. He scolded a young apprentice telling him the knife isn't sharp enough. Take care of it, and the apprentice went and bought a new knife. As I laughed while saying this, the client representatives also laughed out loud. The only one not laughing was her. It seemed like the client's mood had improved. We managed to convince them by agreeing that we take the matter back and present a revised proposal later. After exchanging farewells and leaving the client's office, she still looked like a sulking girl. It was almost 6 p.m., the end of the workday. I called the office to let them know I would head home straight. What was that story about the bar and the knife, she asked. It's just an analogy, I replied. She didn't seem to understand at all. So I told her. I'm heading there now. Want to come with me? Where to, she asked, puzzled. To the bar I mentioned. Let's check it out, I said. She tilted her head in confusion but followed me silently. I took her to the bar. We sat together at the counter facing the kitchen. It's rare to see you with a woman. Said Lisa, the familiar female chef. See, this is the chef I was talking about, I said. The chef is a woman? I introduced her to Lisa as my boss and asked her to tell the knife story. What was that story again? Lisa asked, pretending to forget. Come on, don't tell me you've already forgotten. I said, and started explaining it to her. It was just a few days ago. While I was drinking there, Lisa had complained to me with a frustrated look. She had scolded an apprentice for not sharpening a dull knife properly, but the apprentice had gone out and bought a new knife instead. Yes, you mentioned that earlier. She said, still not getting it. Sharpening a dull knife means to properly sharpen it, not to buy a new one, Lisa explained. Oh, I see. 
She finally understood, I told her. Basically, today, Emily, you did the same thing. The client wanted the knife sharpened, but you tried to sell them a new knife. Isn't that right? I just proposed what I thought was best, as one option, she replied. But there were no options, were there? You just tried to push the new system on them. It was practically a hard sell, I said bluntly. The sulking girl fell silent and lowered her head. Hey, talking to your boss like that, is that okay? Lisa scolded me. You're right. I'm sorry, Emily, I said. It's fine. Maybe I was 10 years too early to be a manager. Gone was the sulking girl, now she looked like a lost, confused, and endearing young woman. Being suddenly promoted to manager must be tough for you too, Emily, I said. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her and spoke as if it wasn't her problem. She gave a small nod and began to share what she had probably kept bottled up inside for a long time. Since childhood, she had been constantly told by her parents and those around her that she was just a girl, and she had grown tired of hearing it. She was determined not to be bound by such an outdated way of thinking. After getting a job, she worked hard in her own way. But reality was harsher than she had imagined. Every day, she told herself that despite her abilities, she wasn't being recognized because she was a woman. Then the company suddenly introduced its policy of promoting women. Without hesitation, she raised her hand. However, once promoted to manager, she was rejected by male employees and resented by female employees. She sighed deeply and buried her face in her hands. Whether male or female, I had no interest in career advancement, so I couldn't fully grasp her struggle. Still, ignoring the client's needs like today isn't acceptable, I said. Yes. I regret that. She replied, dejected. I felt uncomfortable playing the role of a lecturer, something that didn't suit me. Then Lisa brought out an unusual dish. What the heck is this? I didn't order this. Of course not. You didn't order it. Just try it. It's a new menu prototype, Lisa said. For the next three days. She immersed herself in creating a revised proposal, barely taking a lunch break. She also began to seek advice and ask questions from her subordinates, whom she had previously kept at a distance using her managerial authority. It was no exaggeration to say she had transformed. She even made tea for herself and others. As a result, I was also roped into her work and ended up working overtime. Oh, you're working late again today? That's three days in a row. Have you found your work ethic? David told me so as he was leaving. What's so funny? I just want to get out of here and grab a drink, I replied. Talking to me like that, is that appropriate? He chided. The proposal she created was well received, and she successfully secured the contract. What impressed the client the most was her suggestion of optional features they hadn't even requested. Since then, despite being the manager, she often sought my advice. If I could help, I did so to the best of my ability. Then, one day, I was waiting for the end of the workday, thinking about having a drink at my usual bar. She stood in front of me, blocking my way. She said she had something to discuss. Right now? But it's time to go. Can't it wait until tomorrow? It's not directly work-related, so I'd prefer to discuss it after hours. Though it was a bother, I couldn't refuse her determined expression and agreed. She led me to an empty conference room. The setting sun cast a reddish glow through the windows. Closing the door, she spoke to me sincerely. She said she had improved communication with her subordinates. She was slowly gaining confidence as a manager. And then I started to feel bothered and frustrated by how you're underestimated by everyone, she said. Underestimated? I asked. I had never cared about how I was evaluated, whether highly or poorly. I hate to say it, but people call you a salary thief. Hearing that, I couldn't help but burst out laughing. Are you okay with people talking behind your back like that? Well, it's not really talking behind my back. In fact, I think I was the one who started saying it myself. As I shrugged it off, she got all fired up on her own and shook my shoulders, saying, Michael, you're capable of doing your job. Be more positive about it. Hearing her words, I burst out laughing again. Emily, it's not about being positive. 
For me, work is way behind me, while for you, it's straight ahead. We're looking in completely opposite directions. When I said that, she looked at me seriously and said. We can't look in the same direction together? Her passionate gaze made my heart skip a beat for a moment. But in many ways, it was impossible. So I honestly told her, no, that's not possible, and started to leave the conference room. Then she grabbed my arm and stopped me. Really? With you, I could. I cut her off and said. When that system improvement project came up, I happened to lend a hand. That's why she mistakenly thought I was capable of doing this job. It's not that others are underestimating me, Emily. It's that you're overestimating me. I gently removed her hand from my arm and left the conference room. Five years have passed since then. Hey, stop daydreaming and take this dish to that table. The owner said from behind the counter, handing me a large platter. The owner is Lisa, the female chef from the bar I used to frequent. She went independent and opened her own restaurant three years ago. I quit my job at the same time. We got together as a couple. Now, in name only, I'm a co-owner of this place. Lisa handles the cooking, while I help with payments, serving, and dishwashing. Just sitting at the end of the counter with a drink would make me a freeloader. I took the large platter to a table. As I approached, Emily, who was happily sitting with her subordinates, looked even more authoritative and composed. She was the first to notice me and got up from her chair to take the platter from my hands. As she did, I silently wondered, is it okay for you, Emily, to do something like this yourself? She looked at me and, as if to say it's fine, returned a calm and gentle smile.